here this morning. God bless you. We love you all. Yes, we do. And uh, we got a bunch of beautiful looking kids up front here. Amen. 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 Isn't that right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I got some good reads right here. This is beautiful. It says, keep your eyes on me, not only for direction, but also for empowerment. I never lead you to do something without equipping you for the task. That is why it is so important to seek my will in everything you do. There are many burned out Christians who think more is always better, but who deem it unscriptural to say, to say no. In order to know my will, you must spend time with me enjoying my presence. This is not an onerous task, but a delightful privilege. I will show you the path of my life. In my presence is the fullness of joy, and at my right hand there are treasures forevermore. You know, one thing I have learned about the more I, let me, the more I try to get into the Word of God, the more I try to see God through my life, the more joy I seem that like I have in my heart. Because joy just said, you got to seek God's presence. Cause, and God's presence is a fullness of joy. Isn't that right? Amen. And I know each and every one of us in here, that's what we want most, most in our life is peace and joy and happiness. And look, the only person that do that is Jesus Christ. And, and if you really want to see what Jesus Christ looks like, get into his word. Because that's the only way we were ever going to know what Jesus Christ is like. It, it is in his word. And see, look, the more you read his word, the more you get your nose in that book, what I'm trying to say. And the more you read his word, the more you go get it in your computer right here. I call this my computer. And then it's going to fall down in here. And then what's going to happen? The very essence of Jesus Christ is going to flow out to the people. Ooh, I, I got shivers when I said that. No. That's what God wants to do for each, one, each and every one of us in here. He wants us to be just like his son. Because so see, look, our Father, he's our God and he's our Father. <laughs> one of these days, we're going to see what our Father looks like. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for this wonderful, wonderful morning that you gave us. For letting us be here, for the visitors that we got. And Father, I thank you, Father, for the people that uh, on YouTube or the internet watching this service. I bless them in the name of Jesus Christ right now. And Father, right now I ask that the Holy Spirit would take control of this service. And Father, that your will be done in the name of Jesus. While your word says, wherever two or more that's gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Jesus, we know you're here. So I ask that you manifest your peace, manifest your presence to us, God, and just draw us closer to your heart in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. work with children because I tell you what, you're looking at the future Amen. of the gospel. You're looking at them. Amen. And it's so important because they carry on. Before they used to say the mantle, they carry on the mantle. Anyway, they're going to sing for you a song. They're going to give you a scripture and they're going to sing for you a song. John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life Why? 
John's telling me I was a bit shy. <laughs> I tell you what, I think it's the shy ones that become the loudest. How do you believe that? Let's stand and praise the Lord. Let's worship the Lord.
morning. At this time, we'll call our ushers up to partake of the offering. Just have a prayer of thanks, uh, both in English and in me, so I think that that's important. We're two congregations joined here today, and I think that that's awesome. Uh, I'm really blessed to be a part of that. So, uh, Brother Bobby, would you would you voice a prayer in English? And right, go ahead, Brother Will. That that would be correct. Right. Dear Lord, we would get this offering to you, Father. We just pray that it would be multiplied and that would be your needs here. With the community and around the world. We ask all these things in your precious son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. ขราบตั้งตั้งมันตามมันสงเจ้าจู่จองดิโนลปาไปตู่เต้ส่งส่งจองลปาอะเลสส่งทุ่มส่งรูปสายมันส่งบอกเจ้ามีตาโกลปา
change one order of something real quick. I've given some direction on the video uh, for the service this morning, and I'm going to move it to, give me just a minute, but we're going to, I'm going to do it right after the title. Y'all change the order of business, so I'm following a lead, okay? <laughs> but uh, I'll let you know when, okay? How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah, I'm stoked, right? I hope we're all, like, I don't know about you, but prayer and worship time like does something to me. It changes me. It gives me energy. Listening to y'all sing and your music when you play out, even after our service, I'll stick around and just listen to you guys practice. You're very talented people. Very, very talented people. Mary Jane, very talented people. I mean, just we have a lot of talent around us and we're very blessed. Um, I want to start off with some positive media. Okay? Um, I think one of the things our, our world is lacking a lot of is positivity. And so uh, if I came with this first one, I want to make sure that when you go to the store that you don't forget the most important receipt you may ever see. Okay, let me explain that to you. Right at the top, Jesus paid it all. Sin, pain. Shame, pain. Pain, pain. Past mistakes, pain. Rejection and loneliness, pain. Slavery to sin, pain. Spiritual death, pain. Imagine everything that you've ever done wrong, everything that you'll ever do wrong, somebody standing up in the back of the courtroom saying, I would like to pay that person's fee. I would like to pay their fine. And that is what Jesus did on the cross for us. He, he, he surrendered all of it for us. He took all of our sin on himself. He became the sinner. Though he was perfect, he is perfect. He, he had committed no wrong. He had done nothing wrong. And yet he took all of our problems to the, to the grave. His blood shed over all of our sins. We can ask for forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Secondly, name above all names. And I like how this, this picture puts it together. It's got Jesus over all these words. And some might be kind of hard to see out there. But one says Buddha, Muhammad, Allah. God, uh, Jesus is above the Pope. Yeah. Jesus is above Baal. Jesus is above Confucius. Jesus is above all names. There's not a name that comes before and there never will be. Jesus is above all names. Amen. Amen. And this is the last one I want to share with you. Then I'm going to go into a quick time uh, of just some questions that I feel like God's been hitting me with in this message. Check this out. It says on a sign, I don't know where this is at, but how true. God has never stopped being good. We've just stopped being grateful. Amen. Wow. How true is that? Right? I'm sure that there's a lot of truth behind that. So we need to be grateful when God works, when God moves. We need to be saying thank you. When we pray, pray thanks. You know, you ever catch yourself when you pray, you kind of start to, you start to pray bringing God your problems? What about the problems God has already sorted through and worked on and done something with? Have we stopped long enough to say, thank you? 
And I think that that's huge in any relationship growth. The relationship with Jesus is no different. So, do you ever find it difficult to get away from the things in life that you know you shouldn't have anything to do with? Like you know you shouldn't be a part of what you're a part of. Maybe a group that's talking, you know, badly about somebody, or you've got a group that, uh, you know, they they kind of go to church, and they think that because they go to church that they're good, but they really don't believe, and you kind of believe, but you're kind of being pulled with the group. All kinds of different situations. As I talked about last night, we know almost all the time when we're about to make a choice that leads to sin because we've been there before. We, we find a certain comfort in sin and we find ourselves backsliding and going the same direction we already have, right? So we should be able to kind of foresee that some of the direction that we're going in is leading to a place we've already been in realizing that there's no fruit there. Yet we sometimes find ourselves sliding. Anybody with me on that this morning? Okay. So how can there be so many kinds of addictions for us to deal with? How can it be possible? Do you know that you can have addictions that aren't necessarily bad for your body? Anybody addicted to money? That can be bad for your body depending on how you go to get it. Anybody addicted to drugs, alcohol, pornography, all kinds of things that we can be addicted to. And, and if we're honest with ourselves, we probably each have at least one addiction in our life, one vice in our life, whether we realize it or not. I was trying to teach my kids that you can be addicted to Coke. And I'm talking about Coca-Cola, right? Different vari uh, variations of Sprite, Dr. Pepper, whatever it is. You can be addicted to that. One of the ways that you can tell your kids that they're starting to kind of get on this edge is when they say, I'm thirsty, and you give them a water, they say, I don't want that. Well, then you're not thirsty, right? If somebody offers you a drink when you're thirsty, you take the drink because you're thirsty. So one way to be caught in that. But there are addictions of all different magnitudes that we need to understand that because we as a society, we, we only think of certain things. If we can be addicted to, we can really be addicted to anything. We can be addicted to ourselves before anybody else. We can be addicted to ourselves and our own situation before we're addicted to following God and understanding what his plan is for us. Once we get caught in these things, how do we break free? Once you get caught in it, how do you break free? And that's going to be really what we're focusing on this morning. And so today we're going to talk about escaping from sin. Okay? And this is the time I'd like to play that, play that video if you can. So we're going to turn the lights down. You're on with Mark. It's me, Dork. Your sister. You really should go see Mom. She's not doing well. She hasn't been doing well for years. That's why they call it dementia. You should go see her. Dad, I gotta go. I don't even know what I'm doing here. I mean, it's not like you even know who I am. You prayed and believed your whole life. Never done anything wrong. And here you are. You're the nicest person I know. I am the meanest. You have dementia. My life is perfect. Explain that to me. Sometimes the devil allows people to live a life free of trouble. Because he doesn't want them turning to God. Their sin is like a jail cell, except it's all nice and comfy and there doesn't seem to be any need to leave. The door is wide open. Till one day, 
I'm Ron's out. The cell door slammed shut. And suddenly, it's too late. Who did you say you were? So, very powerful video. That's from obviously the movie God's Not Dead, but that is how sin works. The devil allows us to experience a comfort. Like she said, you see she had dementia, you see how God spoke through her. And when he was done, she turned to him and said, who did you say you were? He had no recollection, she had no recollection of that even taking place. God had used it used her in that moment to speak to him. Did you see how he dropped his head when he had given up on her? He dropped his head and he was just like, why am I here? And when she started to speak, his head came up like, what? He was taken. And it's like I mentioned last night, sometimes when God sends us to speak to somebody, he tells us to speak to that person in and of that moment because that's the time that that person is ready to receive. That's the time that their heart is open. God knows that they're in a position where they will hear you. And he sets that up and he says, go. This is the time right here where his mother was able to speak to him for perhaps the first time coherently. And he heard every word. God is not dead. He's very much so alive. And sin will, will hang on to us by the comforts thereof. We need to be aware of that. Another thing we need to know is that sin has been around us since the beginning of time. Y'all know that? Sin existed before Adam and Eve. Did y'all know that? Okay, that serpent that tempted Eve wasn't God. Okay? Sin has been around. I, this really hit me hard as I was studying this. Look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, if you will. I got it up here on the screen, so you don't have to pull it up unless you want to, but you can if you want to. And I'll give everybody just a second. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. And if you have the Bible on your phone, good morning. If you have it on your phone, your tablet, wherever you find it at, please pull it up. Okay, and be a part of that. Now, I'm reading out of an NIV. Whatever you're reading out of is fine. And this is a conversation that is happening between God and somebody I think you might know by the name of Cain. And he says to Cain, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Check this out. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Those words were not just spoken to Cain because they're in God's love letter to his people. Those words were also spoken to us. It's a very clear warning. We need to know that sin desires to have every bit of our attention, every bit of our being, but it, the only way it can have it is if we give it to Satan. Don't give it to Satan. Be aware. Now, this is where it killed me. I check this out. Did you know that when this conversation happened, this happened right before Cain killed Abel? Isn't that amazing? The Lord already knew his heart. He was already confronting his heart. Before he went out and killed Abel. Wow. Isn't that amazing? And the God works the same way in our lives. He tries to tell us about things before we get into trouble. But our problem is we're so caught up that we're not listening. We just completely miss the opportunity. And we're caught in the net that God said we would end up in. But we could have avoided it if we would have just listened. Then we have people in the world on top of all this that want to say that God doesn't exist. There is no God. Psalm chapter 14 verse 1 says this, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who is good. 
I'm going to say that again so we really take this home. There is no one who is good. That means that nobody in here this morning, I'm not trying to hurt feelings, but God's word says it, myself included, there is no one who is good. We become good because of who he is, not because of who we are. Okay? And so we need to be, I, I want to be painted with the blood of Christ because without it, I'm, I'm dust blowing in the air. The thing is, a lot of times here, this will be a position for us to try to judge each other, right? We start going, well, I'm, I've got some issues in my life, but thank God I'm not as bad as he is. I've shared this with you before, right? Generally, when we get in the position of trying to point other people out, we say, well, at least I'm not as bad as he is. You're right. You're not. You're worse. Because you can't see, you can't see the own trouble that you have in your life. You want to see the trouble in somebody else's life. Uh, I believe the Bible refers to you're trying to pull the splinter out of your brother's eye when you can't even see the, what is it, the word, the law in your own, right? It's a really good, it's a really good picture of what it is. Look at the way the Bible begins in Genesis 1-1. And I really want to pay close attention to the first four words because this is something our world gets hung up on so much. In the beginning, God. Now, I stop there for a second. That's obviously not the whole verse, but in the beginning, God. Now, people say, well, who created God? Nobody. God is God. Amen. This, this is going to take a faith. This is a full submission of faith to accept this. God is God. He always has been, always, always is, and forevermore will, it, will be. Amen. God is God. And he can do as he pleases. He created the heavens and the earth. The Bible makes it very clear. It says there in 1 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It took me a second to really understand that God created the heavens first. That's why it was put together in that order. And it also makes sense when you think about how Lucifer was cast out of heaven. How did the serpent end up in the garden? It had to happen first, right? So heaven was around for some time in the way we see it before earth was even around. Okay? God exists and he desires so much, so badly to be chosen by us. That's what he wants. He wants to be chosen. He never forces himself on us. We, we call God the author of creation because he is. And he could have created all of us to automatically just believe in God. We could have been pre-programmed to say that God is God and that's it. But he didn't. He gave everybody choice in so many things. And the choice that he gave us here that's so important to remember is the choice to either accept him or to reject him. Giving us an opportunity to choose him because he wants to be chosen, not forced. I found myself in some old territory. I heard Paul Jerry say one time, it's an old one, but it's a good one, right? So we're going to cover some old ground. I think that it's so important that we address sin often. Romans 3.23 calls all of us out. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Who is not included in all? Let's just cover that real quick. Because we have a world that feels like, well, thank God I'm not part of that. It says, for all have sinned. Every single one of us has, we have dirt in our closet. We have issues that we need to deal with. That means that we all have sin and that all of us have to check it. If you're not planning on checking your sin at the feet of Jesus, then you're going to carry that sin perhaps for the end of time, right? It will follow you. And in a world right now that's so full of division, it is so full of division, how can we not see it? Yeah, somebody raise a hand if you see the division in our world, please. I mean, I think every hand would go up if we're being honest. The truth of it is we're more divided now than we have ever been. But what God illustrates in this, this section of Scripture is that all of us are soldered together in sin. There's not one of us that's any better, not one of us that's any worse. We all have to check it. We all have it. We all need to be responsible with it. Romans 6.23 says why sin is important. Because the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 
We all have sin, and we all have to address that sin. The wages of sin is death, so if you're going to carry it, get ready to die. And we're not talking about just ending your life. We're talking about your ultimate, your ultimate destination, where you end up at. You can live a life and say to yourself that I don't need God. I don't need him at all. I don't need any part of him. But one day you're going to have to answer for that. And one day you will not find yourself in heaven. It's just the reality of what this is. Let's not lie to ourselves. Checking our sin is, is to give it to God and say, I am sorry. And it's a legitimate thing. It's not a, you can't fake this. You, we can fake each other. You know how often we fake each other every day? Hey, how are you? We always say, I'm good. Some days you're not good. Come on. Why, why do we do it? You know, because we're trying, we don't want to put our burden on somebody. We don't want to, we don't want to have to get into a conversation and explain why we're not good. Sometimes we just don't want to. So I'm, I'm good. I'm great. You can't do that to God. You can say, I'm good. And he would say, why are you lying? Why are you why are you putting yourself out there as something different than what you are? He's able to check our hearts. The gift of God is the gift that he's holding out to us still today, still this morning, because by the very fact that Jesus has not come back yet, he's holding this gift out of eternal life and salvation. All we have to do is take it from him. He wants you to take it from him. That's why his hands are out like this. If you saw a picture of it, he probably almost falling over to give it to us. But yet we sit there and we watch him hold it. If you've never before taken it from him, take it today. You might say, I know all this already. Well, then what is it that allows you to so easily backslide your faith? How do you end up back on your face? Because sin is comfortable. We, we're so used to it. We know the channels, and though, though we know it's not where God wants us to be, it's familiar territory, so we do it again. As I shared last night, one of the things that I believe, and I, I get caught up in sin too. I'm not saying I'm better than anybody in here. Anybody listening online, listen, I'm just as guilty, if not more so, than you may be. When we catch ourselves sliding down the roads of familiarity, we need to stop and get on our knees and say, Lord, I know where this road goes. I know where this road will take me. And I know that I don't need to be going down this road anymore. Lord, change my heart. Change my outlook. Change the way that I feel right now. Please repair me. Change me and put me on a new path. That's for you. But if we don't stop, you're going to get used to territory you've already been in. Because we have a tendency to give in to what we know. And it's hard for us to do something that we know. And that's why sin is such an important thing to check. What if I was to tell you that our backsliding actually boils down to faith? Now this one, this one hit me as well. Now I ended up in James chapter 2 verse 17. It says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. That speaks volumes to the church in itself because we can all stand up here on Sunday and be like, I believe, I believe, I believe, and then go out there and act like we don't. How we really believe and how we really show Christ in us is what we do outside of these walls, not what we do inside of them. This is just a building. And if God demolished it, then we would still have to find it in ourselves and our calling to preach outside of this building, wherever we end up. That's what we're called to do. Every one of us is to share the word as believers, disciples of God, the followers of Christ, to share the word with anybody we come into contact with. But this is where I started to think about this. Where the action is slowing, the action that's supposed to be behind the faith, where that action is slacking, we have a tendency to then replace faith in the Lord with faith in ourselves or of the world. That's a dangerous, dangerous thing to play with. That's where we lose what is important and we become comfortable with whatever the world says. With whatever they throw at us, we're just like, ah, you know, I, I don't feel like we should be a part of this, but everybody's doing it, so can it really be that bad? If you don't see everybody in here doing it, it is bad. Stay away from it. And I don't care if you have multitudes going left. 
If it's not in Scripture and God's not calling you to be a part of that, you need to stay on the run. Amen. Amen. Hard to do sometimes, especially when your friends, your family members, people you love and care about are going to the left. And you might be crying. You may be on your knees sobbing, on your knees sobbing, losing, losing all your emotion and tears to watch it go down. But we're called to follow Christ, not them. We hear a lot of career politicians talking about people needing to be reprogrammed. Y'all hear that lately? Y'all need to be reprogrammed. In particular, the, the attack comes for people that believe in, in Republican uh, beliefs and followed, you know, Donald Trump and wanted to wanted him to serve another term. But it's not just it's not just one side. It's not one party. This is a group of wicked people that want us all to be reprogrammed to believe whatever they tell us. Whatever they put in front of us. They could tell you to get down and eat dirt and they want you to say, I will. Right? By the power of Christ, we have the ability right now to say, I will not. Okay? Although I do not believe that any of their intentions in this reprogramming have anything to do with a life lived for Christ, I do not entirely disagree. My thing here is that I think that we need to be deprogrammed of the worldly things, the fleshly things, and we need to get in our Bibles, as Gary said, get our nose in the book and be reprogrammed with the Holy Scriptures. Amen. We need to be reprogrammed with following Christ, not, not the way we do things, not what the world tells us is right or what's wrong or otherwise, but what God says is right. What God says is wrong. It's standing against anything in the world that stands against God. It's hard to do, but we got to stand up. We've got to stand up and let our voices be heard for Christ. Not only for Christ, but the ones that are contemplating what they believe in. The ones that aren't sure where they stand. The ones that are trying to make a decision as to whether they believe or not. What better, what better information can you give them than the truth? To make a choice one way or another. And you're not responsible... You're not responsible for the harvest, but we are all responsible to be planting seed. Amen. Okay? So we got to get out there and get our bags, our bags in one hand and our hands and chicken feed in the other and be ready to go. We need to have the programming of the world taken out and the flawless programming of the Lord Jesus Christ consume us. When we are dialed into Christ, we give Him priority in our lives. We can confess our sins at his feet. Our faith at that time will be shown. Check this out. This might hurt, but it's real. Our faith will be shown to us by what we do next. If you fall at the feet of Christ and you ask for forgiveness, you've got to really be sorry and really give it to him, but then repent. Repent is where you say, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to go the exact opposite way on purpose. I don't know where that road goes because I've never gone down it before, but I'm making a clear Conscious choice to go the opposite way of the things that I know that are wrong. Repentance. Right? Our faith will be shown to us by what we do next. Am I saying that everybody's going to leave here today believing in the Word of God and be perfect? I'm not. But what I am saying is that God's Word says that we're supposed to deny ourselves and pick up our cross daily. We're all going to slip. We're all going to slip, but we have to acknowledge that we're slipping. Get down on our knees, get right, pick up our cross and roll. If you have never before made the choice to trust in Jesus, will you make a choice to trust in Him now? Today, before you leave this place, before you turn off this live feed, will you make a choice to trust in Jesus? I'm going to share with something with you guys that I don't think I've ever shared with anybody in my entire life. When I was a kid, I, I grew up, I uh, went to Edgewater Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I went to, uh, if we called it Adventure Club on Wednesday nights. That was our RAGA setup. Uh, they, they had church service on Wednesday night and on Sunday morning. Somewhere in there, I got to watch a movie called Left Behind with Kirk Cameron in it. Anybody ever seen that? Okay. I, I've not seen any of the new ones, so I don't know if they're biblically sound at all or not. They may, they may be, they may not be. So don't, don't take anything from that. But I do remember that I had never thought about the end of time this way. When Jesus came back, he took his people home. Now scripture says that he will come like a thief in the night. 
It'll come so fast and so quick. We can't, we can't get ready for it. We can't anticipate it. We can't even, can't even hardly respond to it. It just, it's gone, it's done. In the movie, there were all these piles of clothes where people used to be. And they were everywhere. People had lost, they thought they lost their child. They thought they lost their mother, their father, their grandparents. There were just these piles of clothes where they used to be. And people thought, you know, there was some kind of alien abduction. Something terrible was going on. Maybe we were under attack. It was a national security issue. We need to be thinking about this in the way that Jesus will come back. Because we don't know exactly every single detail. We know how he'll show up, but we don't know what everything looks like and how he takes us out. But what killed me one day is that I saw this movie. I watched it from beginning to end a couple of times, actually. And I saw very clearly that we all have a choice. We all get a choice as to whether we're going to follow Jesus or whether we're going to follow something else. We all get that opportunity. And one day, I woke up at my house in Minneapolis, and I don't know what the deal was. I don't know what day it was. I didn't, I didn't record it. But I know that nobody was at my house. Nobody was there. I don't, know, I don't know where my parents were. I don't know where my sisters were. I have no idea. But all I know is I woke up. Check this out, how eerie this is. The house was silent. We lived right off of 42nd Street in Minneapolis, which is actually a fairly busy street. It got so eerie, I had to go outside to see if anybody was moving, to see if I could find any noise. I went outside the house. I didn't even hear a bird. There were no cars moving. There were no people walking to and from their cars. I went out to 42nd Street, literally stood in the middle of two lanes to see traffic come and go. Not one car. I really felt for a second like Jesus had come back and taken his people home and I wasn't with him. I was so broken, I, I didn't know what to do. I was like, is it possible? That Jesus came back and took everybody. He took my whole family. And I wasn't right with him, so he let me in. I really battled that. That was, that was rough. And that lasted for probably, I'm going to say it lasted for an hour. But you know when you're freaking out, time, time is a lot shorter than we think it is. It was probably 20 minutes. But I remember just looking at my neighbor's house looking around where people are generally moving and gardening and working. There wasn't an airplane that flew over my house. You know how unusual that is in that part of Minneapolis? You used to usually see like 10 in a 10 minutes ten. I mean, they're constantly overhead. Not one. And it's crazy because even in that moment, I still did not respond fully to what had happened. When my family finally started to show up and I started to see movement again, I was like, thank you, Jesus. But I never let that impact me like it should have. That memory came back to me. I had 100% visibility in that the other night. I'm going to tell you this. I really don't want to be left behind. And in, in second to that, I really don't want anybody else to be left behind either. When you make the choice to follow Christ, to give him your heart, your soul, and you invite him into your heart as your Lord and Savior, and you follow him, you deny yourself and pick up your cross and walk with him daily, you will never have to worry about being left behind. But if you continue to play the game that I've got this, I can take care of everything on my own, you may never need it. Something for you to think about this morning. As we prepare to observe the Lord's Supper this morning, I've got some church information up here that'll be coming up in just a second for anybody watching live that wants to know how to get a hold of us. But I'd like to, if I can, just open up, open up a time of quiet prayer. And if anybody wants to come up and kneel on the altar this morning and pray to, to just get right with God, I want to invite you to do that. And immediately following that, we will, we will, we will observe the Lord's Supper this morning. But I just feel like that's what God's telling me to do right. God is my leader, so I'll follow the word. All right? But if you've got somebody you want to pray for, also take this time. Remember, the, the Bible says that we're supposed to observe ourselves 
before we, we partake of the Lord's Supper. If we have something we need to get right with it, we need to do that right now. We're not supposed to carry that into this. Okay? So, Kathy, if you have an instrument you'd like to play, let's just, you can pray right where you are. There's nothing special about these steps. But this is just a place to show humility to Christ. And I want to invite you to partake in that at this time. Thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you. 